some order for the open workshop, January 28th, it is 6.02. I'll take a roll call. Trustee Alonzo is absent. Trustee Broderick. Present. Trustee Burke. Present. Trustee Casayas. Here. Trustee Egan. Present. Trustee Finnerty. Here. Trustee Wilbeck. Here. Vice President Munoz. Here. President Bellato. Here. At this time, I'd like to turn the meeting over to Mr. Castle. We have a presentation on our audit and our CAFRA report. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Um, from our order, we have Mr. Robert uh, Morrison here to prevent our CAFR and our AMR. Um, he'll give you all the details. If you have any questions, just hold to the end and he'll be able to answer. Okay, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, you should have gotten two documents. Pick one and a a skinny one. The thick one is the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or CAFR. I will refer to it as a CAFR from here on in because the other is just too much for me to say. Uh, the, the, the auditors, the thin one is the Auditor's Management Report. Uh, that is a state of New Jersey mandated document. It's usually not part of uh, the audit deliverables in most other states. Anyway, uh, the CAFR is basically the district's financial statements that we have come in and performed an audit on and have issued our opinion based on the results of our audit. Uh, they're not our financial statements. When people see these books, they think that we, we may have printed them, but they're not our numbers. They are the district's numbers. There's no changes made to the numbers presented to us by the school district unless the district concurs with those changes. Uh, that said, uh, we, we conducted our audit, we followed governmental accounting board standards, we followed st additional standards required by the Comptroller General of the United States, and various grant regulations for all of your major federal and state programs. Basically, the objective of the audit is to determine whether or not the district's financial statements are fairly presented, meaning are they accurate? Do the numbers make sense? Um, are they complete? Is there anything missing from those numbers? Uh, were the proper accounting principles used to prepare those numbers? And were those accounting principles applied consistently from year to year? Uh, what we do is we come in and we test substantive testing of significant account balances. So we, we spend a lot of time making sure that the cash is all there. We spend a lot of time making sure large accounts receivable are actually there. Uh, we spend a lot of time verifying your accounts payable, making sure they're all there. Uh, but we also do tests of your internal controls because we can't test every transaction. So what we do is we look at the controls over the processing of those transactions to determine if there's any weaknesses. And if we find something that looks like there could be a weakness, and a weakness in internal control is a situation where somebody could make a mistake, intentionally or unintentionally, and that mistake would not get caught and corrected prior to the preparation of financial statements, and that error would result in a misstatement of the financial statement. So we rely on the district's internal controls, and we test them to make sure they're working. When we get done, I look at all the evidence we've gathered, I look at all the documentation we've gathered, and I determine if I can issue my opinion. I then have other partners in my firm review my work to make sure that I'm not taking shortcuts. And when it's all said and done, we issue our opinion on the financial statements. In the CAFR document, our opinion is on pages 11 through 13. It takes auditors three pages to say what I can say in three sentences, which is essentially that we believe that the financial statements are a fair representation of the district's financial position at the end of the year, that the appropriate accounting principles were followed, and that those principles were followed consistently from year to year. It's what's known in the, the trade as an unmodified opinion. It's the best opinion we can issue. So we were very happy with the condition of the records, and we were able to certify that your financial statements are accurate. Uh, I have notes here. I want to make sure I stick to them.
Okay, in addition to the opinion on the financial statements, uh, because the district receives and expends more than $750,000 in federal aid and state aid, uh, we have to do a scope expansion on our audit. Essentially, we have to follow, as I mentioned earlier, governmental, governmental auditing standards, which is a set of additional standards required by the Comptroller General of the United States. Uh, it involves additional continuing education for the audit staff. It involves a higher level of independence from the client. And it involves an expansion of the analysis and testing of both internal controls and the district's compliance with laws and regulations. In addition to that work, we also have to identify major grant programs and do a deep dive test of the transactional activity and the district's compliance with the governing regulations. Every grant, whether it's federal or state, comes with a list of compliance requirements as to types of activities allowed or unallowed, required reporting. Uh, th there can be as many as 12 or 13 different compliance requirements. If we select a grant as a major program, we test all of those compliance requirements. Now, major programs are selected based on a variety of criteria. One could be simply because they're very large grants. Large dollar values uh, catch, you know, hit our radar. Uh, however, if the, if the program has been operated by the district for several years and we haven't found anything wrong with it, that takes a lower priority to a new grant with a new program coordinator that maybe he isn't or she isn't quite as familiar with the compliance requirements, so there might be a risk of noncompliance. Uh, we also look at grants that have tricky compliance requirements, because not all grants are, are equal when it comes to compliance, and some are definitely trickier than others. So based on either complexity, size, or newness, we will select major programs and do the audits. We've issued two reports based on that scope expansion, and they're all the way in the back of the CAFR document. They're on pages 176 and 177, and 178 through 180. The first report on 176 and 177 is our report on internal control over financial reporting and on compliance on a district-wide level. And again, auditor jargon takes two pages to basically say that for internal control purposes, we believe that the district has a, has a system of internal controls that are appropriate for an organization of your size, and that based on our testing, uh, we found that the internal controls have been placed into operation and are operating effectively. That's an unmodified opinion on internal controls. For compliance, we do as many as 40 different tests of compliance. It can cover IRS regulations, it could cover state regulations, the purchasing law that requires you to go out to bid in certain circumstances, or requires you to get documentation from vendors over $17,500. Uh, we, we, and after we get done those tests, we include that in this report. We found no reportable non-compliances. So this is also an unmodified opinion. The third report on major grant programs deals with whether each program complied with its applicable federal or state regulations and whether or not the internal controls over compliance are in place. And this report, again, in three pages, basically says that your internal controls over compliance for your grant projects, which basically involves the knowledge of the compliance requirements, and additional steps in your authorization and approval processes or your financial reporting processes where necessary uh, are in place. We found no internal control issues. We found no non-compliances. So that's the third and final unmodified opinion. Uh, that's the equivalent of hitting the trifecta. So congratulations to the business office for producing a set of financial statements and, and maintaining a set of internal controls over both financial reporting and compliance that we believe will keep the district in good shape. 
As for the financial statements themselves, right, this report is thick for a reason. Uh, and the reason is because there's three different sets of financial statements in this document. The first section, the A section of the CAFR, has financial statements that are full accrual, entity-wide financial statements. These, these financial statements were designed by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board in an attempt to make government financial statements look something like private sector financial statements. I personally think they failed miserably. Uh, the state of New Jersey does not use the A section of the report for any purpose whatsoever. So I basically suggest that you pay no attention to section A. Uh, there's then a B section which would normally be the section of the financial statements I would tell you to focus on. That is a fund by fund modified accrual reporting following the accounting requirements of the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, which is the standard setter for all state, local, municipal, school district um, entities. The problem with that is that the state of New Jersey has created departures from those standards, in particular relating to the recognition of state aid revenue. And this goes back now for 25 years, the first incursion occurred. Uh, a governor who shall be nameless uh, found herself short in her state budget in the 90s. Uh, and, and what she decided to do to balance the state budget was take the 20th state aid payment and Instead of you getting a, your 20th and last payment of your state aid in June, she did not budget it in the fisc state fiscal year if it ended June 30th. Instead, she budgeted in the succeeding state fiscal year, and you now get a payment in July. Following, following that governor, another governor of a different political persuasion also found himself short on his budget, and he took a state aid payment. So you're now down to 18 out of 20 state aid payments that you get during your fiscal year. The other two are not appropriated by the state until after the close of your fiscal year. So as a result, we're not allowed on a generally accepted accounting principles basis to recognize those 19th and 20th state aid payments. As a result, the B section of the report shows a lower fund balance than the C section of the report. So the B section is of relatively little value to you. The C section of the report is the Bible. That represents what the state of New Jersey bases your budgets, bases your statutory limitations on, and that's where we calculate your permitted, unreserved, unassigned fund balance. The C section of the report uh, starts on page 85. Uh, the Schedule C1 is a 10-page document. It basically is a, um, a mirror image of your board secretary's report with one exception. And the one exception is for both revenue and expenditure purposes, uh, we have to add to what is included in the board secretary's report the values of pension payments for TPAF employees paid into the pension system by the state of New Jersey. Uh, we have to recognize the costs of post-employment health care for all of your retirees that are paid by the state of New Jersey. And we have to recognize the employer's share of uh, Social Security and Medicare costs for TPAF employees. Those numbers are not available to the district on June 30th when you close your books. They come out late July, or early August. And as a result, uh, we add them to both the revenue and expenditure side when we put together the C1. Uh, it doesn't affect fund balance. It just raises the total revenues that you see and the total expenditures that you see. Anyway, uh, the good news is you had a good year, as C1 indicates. Uh, you are, you're still at your full 2% fund balance that you're allowed to have, plus you are able to put some money into a capital reserve, you're able to put some money into a maintenance reserve, 
and you were able to put some money aside, which I believe the plan is to increase your capital outlay budget in the next budget cycle. So those are all very positive things that resulted. Now, how did you generate that? Predominantly, the, the excess revenue, the, the favorable budget variance, resulted from tighter budgetary controls. When I was here last year, we were talking about uh, some problems that the district had with its authorization and approval process for purchase orders, with, with its uh, control of overtime. Those problems, and I'll get to them in a little more specificity a little further along here, but those problems were corrected, and the ma managerial control over the budget process has improved significantly to the, to the benefit of the district as a whole. And uh, the control over budgetary line items, I think, made a big difference and is, is a good reason for why you had the favorable variances. So that's a very positive uh, development in the last year. Can you say that one more time? <laughs> I, the, the, the improvement in, in the budgetary controls in the last fiscal year uh, are, 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 have a significant responsibility for the favorable budget variance, and that's a very, very positive outcome. Uh. And Mr. Morrison, excuse me, on page 188, you have question course. What would that involve? On page 188, 188 question, question cost. Question cost would be a cost that based on the, the uh, allowable or, or unallowable cost permitted in the grant agreement uh, would be something that we're not sure is allowable. So, for example, if, if, uh, if we're looking at a, um, a, a IDEA grant, which is um, a handicapped education grant, and generally the district uses it to provide either in-house additional special ed or is you, it's used to pay tuition to out-of-district placements for the handicap. If we were to see expenditures in there for, um, you know, co-curricular activities, we would question those costs. And if, if we determined that they were not allowed, the value of those purchase orders would appear as question costs. So it's, it's based on our review of what's allowable and what's not allowable in each of the grant documents. What page is that? That's part of the single audit section, right? That's one of the, one of the things that we test as part of the grant compliances is uh, whether or not the grant was spent for the purposes it was intended to be. Some grants, as I mentioned, are, are um, more complicated than others. For example, uh, in some districts, Title I grants are limited to specific census tracts, and not all the schools in the district will qualify for them. And as a result, you're limited into, as to what you can do. Uh, and if, if, if uh, we find that a district is spending the money as if the entire district was qualified, and in fact they're putting things into schools that don't fit into the census tracts, we'd, we'd, have, to qualify, we'd have to have uh, question costs for the entire expenditure. Even if it was for the educational purpose it was intended for, it just didn't meet the qualifications based on census tract. So, there's, there's a variety of ways you can end up with a question cost. It can be, we are not, we do not have question. you do not have question costs. That's correct. We found no question costs. <laughs> okay. Um, if we go to Section F of the report. Section F of the report is basically your capital projects fund. Right? You have, you have significant capital projects that go back uh, about, at this point, five, five to six years uh, that are winding down. You still have some state aid that's, that's due on them. Uh, the applications for the reimbursement, the state is slow on reimbursement. So, uh, essentially, you've got $4.9 million of unexpended funds. Uh, the, the state of New Jersey owes you $4.2 million, uh, and the difference between those two, which is roughly $800,000, is your unexpended fund balance. Uh, is that 
that something we can depend upon? The fund balance? The the, the seven hundred and ninety five, yes. Right? If if you were to spend all four million nine hundred thousand uh, we would have to see whether or not the state reimbursed you because the application for state aid reimbursement is um, driven. It's, it's a, essentially they do an audit of your, your program costs for each project. Uh, you have engineering sign offs, you have uh, the business administrator has to sign off, and then they want documents, right? You copies of purchase orders. But You've been getting your reimbursements. Your process for developing your applications for reimbursement has been solid. Uh, so we're not worried. Um, I just pointed out because it, it's one of your major account groups. I want to cover them all. <laughs> uh, briefly, I would just say on your, your food service account, because you run an in-house program, food service run in, that is run in-house tends to be an area where some districts lose money and the taxpayers are forced to uh, contribute to the, to the operations of food services. That's not the case here. That, the reason I'm mentioning it is to specifically state that you ran a, a uh, food service program that, that generated a profit of $275,000 last year. You have $834,000 in retained earnings or fund balance uh, in your food service fund. If that number grows, you can then start using some of that money to make improvements to the cafeterias, buy new equipment, etc. I'm sorry, could you give me a page number on that, please? The food service fund is pages uh, 134 to 136. Thank you. Right, the district participates in the National School Lunch Program, and you get a significant amount of revenues from the National School Lunch Program, you're, you're in compliance with all of the requirements of the National School Lunch Program. On pages 138 to 140, uh, there is an internal service fund, which is basically uh, a fund that the district created last year to do its accounting for its health benefits costs. Essentially, you, you pay health benefits for people who are employed directly out of your operating fund, who are assigned to grant programs, who are part of your, your special revenue fund, and your cafeteria workers. So there's three different places where um, expenditures are incurred for health benefits. So what the district decided to do last year was take all of the, the budgeted funds for health benefits, move them into a separate fund, and then pay all the benefit costs from there. It's a bit of a cumbersome way of doing things, and in conversations with uh, the, the new school business administrator, uh, we both are in agreement that we would like to unwind this thing and put it back into each of the individual funds going forward. So this way, uh, you don't accumulate any fund balances or any deficits outside of your budgetary operations. Uh, we think it's a cleaner way to do it. So Fund 70, which is the internal service fund, it's here now. It will get blended back into the various funds for June 30th, 2020. On page 143, I'm mentioning this only because you were, again had favorable results. You, had a, you have your unemployment fund. Uh, you, you operate. On a, you operate the unemployment insurance as a trust fund. Essentially, you withhold money from the employees. The state bills you for any unemployment costs they pay, and if required, the district kicks in funds from its operating budget to make up the difference. Your unemployment fund went positive, and uh, as a result, you did not have to make a contribution. So your un unemployment fund is now positive, very positive, very good thing. I'm not going to say positive too many times. Uh, that's pretty much the high points of the, of the financial statements. If you look at the, the smaller document, the uh, auditor's management report, I would point out first that last year we had six recommendations. They included um, problems with payroll register approvals, problems with overtime authorization, supervision, and reporting, 
Uh, we had a, a, an unusually large number of confirming orders that we noted in the report, which is people committing the district's funds without going through the purchase order process. We noted uh, a lack of documentation concerning compliance with the state's pay-to-play laws, which is basically if you're going to give a vendor more than $17,500 worth of business without going through a fair and open process, as defined in the law, uh, you're supposed to gather some information regarding who owns the company and whether or not they've made political contributions. Uh, and then finally, we had a problem with the low and moderate income counts in last year's application for state school aid. All six of those issues were addressed in a corrective action plan that the board approved beginning of last year, and they were all corrected timely. So none of those problems w is, is repeated in this audit, and in fact, as I mentioned earlier, correcting a couple of those problems, I think directly uh, influenced the favorable uh, budget variance for the year. In this report, and again, veterans know to go to the last page. The last, the last page is the summary of the auditor's recommendations. We have two this year, and they are both relatively minor. One is uh, a recommendation relating to revenue recognition. And essentially what we're saying in the recommendation is if you can accrue a revenue, accrue the revenue, rather than posting cash on a payment by payment basis. So for state aid, accrue your state aid at the start of the school year. For your taxes receivable, accrue your taxes at the start of the year and post your receipts coming in against the receivable rather than posting it payment by payment. It's a bookkeeping thing. Uh, the second recommendation relates to the food service fund, and this is, a, this is more of a housekeeping item. We noted some minor differences between what the reports coming from food service indicated was their profit and loss, and what the business office was showing as actual cash received and cash dispersed. So the recommendation here is to true up those numbers on a monthly basis. Again, not, not a, uh, a significant finding, a relatively easy fix and uh, not as dramatic an impact when it is fixed, unfortunately. So those, those are what we have. Um, cons compared to last year, we consider them to be very minor. And uh, pretty much that's it. Before I open it for any questions, I would like to acknowledge all of the help we get in doing our audit from the staff here. We get complete cooperation. They give us a nice place to work. And everybody is very friendly towards us. Sometimes people aren't always friendly to the auditors. Um, we, get, we, get, we, we get camaraderie here as well as assistance, and we appreciate it. And with that, if anybody has any questions. Mr. Morrison, I have one. Uh, I'm familiar with the fact that we get a report from July and on a normal basis, we would take out a loan to meet the salary needs, et cetera. When does a secondary one come out? In, in regards to, I believe it was the state submitting, uh, or not paying the, you said it was 20 out of 22. Yes, yeah, that, that's on the state aid. Right, they, you, in, at the end of July, you get a check from the state of New Jersey to make you whole for the prior June 30th. So they're, they're operating a month behind but you're recognizing it on June 30th as part of your fund balance. It's, it's, a, it's a quirk, and that's why you can't rely on the B section of the report to see where you really are. There's an adjustment we make on the C section to take you to the B. It's, I mean, it's been institutionalized, and it's never going to get reversed at this point. So it's just, it's just part of the way every school district in New Jersey operates. Okay. Well, thank you. If, if anybody decides they have any questions at a later point, feel free to give me a call. Thank you. I need your phone number. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Okay. I, don't, I don't see it. I'll there give you, you my, I'll, I'll, I'll handwrite my cell phone number for you. Sure. Okay.
Oh, it's in Shannon, sorry. If, if, I'll give you, if you would like my cell phone number, I'd be happy to give it to you. Yeah, <laughs> I would like it. Sure. I, 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 can, I could do it. Okay. 908. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you. 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 Thank uh, everything was sent home. There are about two or three items I'll go over that you didn't get. Um, first off, approval of minutes, acceptance of communications. Who would like to move that? Okay. I'll uh, second. And Jody will second. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to bring your attention to resolution. A3. Um, this is our committee meeting. Uh, this is the, two, the, the 2020 NJASA Texco Conference in Atlantic City. Uh, I received a request from Trustee Alonzo, who would like to attend the conference. Uh, I just point out that it is an administrative conference. Uh, usually board members wouldn't attend, uh, but I did tell the trustee I would present the resolution, um, but it has to be approved by the board if you want to send him on this conference. May I make a comment on that? Um, I, I looked it up. There are two keynote uh, speakers, both of whom are educators. Do we have any teachers going to this Expo? We have five administrators going. One, two, three, four, five administrators, no teachers. Well, as I said, both keynote speakers are directing the focus of their keynote address to educators. I was just well, concerned as to why we don't have uh, educators like one or two. I think once again, and maybe the administrators can help me, it's an administrator's conference it's by their associated. ASA is the superintendent's conference. That's the conference that it is. So I guess the I'm cut sorry? to the It's a superintendent's conference. ASA is the association of school administrators. It's superintendents, yeah. assistant superintendents. So I guess the cut to the chase, I have two copies of the resolution. I have one with the trustee and one without the trustee. What is your, um, what is your feeling? Secretary Mead, I'd like to make the motion to put the resolution without the trustee forward to the board. It's an administrator's conference. A board member does not have to go. I'll second it. Informal poll. Everybody raise their hand. That agrees with the uh, motion in a second. Okay. So I'll make that correction, and I'll let the trustee know. Just one last question, Dr. Mina. On the, um, usually we have an explanation of what's going on in a field trip, or, like I said, I looked this up. Why is there not? Um... I think it was in your original draft package that I okay. put on your I remember emails reading that it had all your backups. Obviously, when we got to the committee meetings, unless it was a new resolution, I removed all that backup since it was a duplicate of what you had already received. So the only backup I would include in this package is just anything that you didn't see. Uh, okay, thank anything you. that you've seen already would have to back up to it. All right, so that is my only other addition for curriculum. And that was moved by Trustee Finnerty, and it was seconded by Trustee Wilbach. Moving ahead to finance. Um, obviously, Mr. Morrison just did B11 and B12. I believe your resolutions in your packet, and I apologize, are out of order. 
the corrective action plan might be for before the CAFR, but I'll make that announcement to the audience. The only other resolution I'd like you to look at is B13. Came in since um, I sent your package home. And this is just approval to accept donations. Uh, from now on, anytime the district gets some sort of donation or gift, it'll be done by resolution. And you saw we already had one on the agenda. It's this would be the second. Yeah. It's not in the past. That's because it's it, was right. in the, it was in the original. <laughs> That's because it's yeah. right here. It was in the original no, set home. It's right. No, it wasn't. Yeah, it's it was. right here where well, Dr. I, May sorry, was I supposed it, to hand it out. I had it on finance. But that's an addition no, no. to the one that you oh, have. Oh, okay. That's an addition. The school specifically received this, and the school principal put together this resolution. This is not a new resolution that I, I just did. got today. Oh, I thought this was the BEF one. It. No, that was the one. Yeah, okay. Thank you. And uh, if that pile of B13 was any closer, it would have been. So we're given approval that we're going to accept $5,000? Yes. Yes, you have to. Don. Yeah. <laughs> Should we call this? Whenever we receive something, it'll be done by resolution. Okay. Okay, that is, B, uh, that is all the Bs. Uh, it was moved by Trustee Egan. And it was seconded by Trustee Broder. Moving ahead to personnel, there's two resolutions I need to do inside, but I'd like to point out resolution C32 and C33. I received these since the committee meetings. You didn't get a chance to see these. Um, C32 is the services of a consultant for a workshop and mentoring. Uh, there's some February dates, and this is with Learning Tree. And then C33 is a contract with Dr. Deborah Bozaki, um, a state approved physician. She's doing evaluations uh, in regards to dyslexia, psychology complete moral psychology evaluations for classified students in the district. Okay. Uh, the other two we will do inside. I'm sorry, I don't seem to have a, wait, wait a minute, maybe I'm missing it. Uh, C32. I got 33, where's 32? 32 is three pages long. No, wait, 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 wait. I didn't see this on the. Uh, there you go, man. Oh, there we go. Okay, got yeah, it. Thank you. It All right. And the personnel resolutions were moved by Trustee Burke, and they were seconded by Trustee Kasaya. Okay. I had a couple of issues on C. I don't know if I'd like to move them to non-consent or. Which uh, Joe just give me the number? Sure. Let's start with um, C15. One second. Okay. Actually, I, I went to this last night, and it's an excellent program. Uh, it's certainly that I would certainly want to do. Uh, my only problem with this particular resolution right now, and I, and I understand it's just to put in people to give the test, but the program itself, I would just like to have some kind of financial background to it. And I actually spoke to the business administrator today. He assured me that it was in a pretty good amount. I don't know if he'd want to sure. let us all know about that, though. Sorry, I can give an estimated cost. Uh, we don't know the total number of students that are going to be enrolled. Um, so that fluctuates with bus and uh, transportation costs and everything. But um, I, can, I feel pretty confident saying an estimated total cost per year of under $30,000. Um, that's like, you know, the top end of where we would be with this program. Which I think is excellent. Because um, I went to this, and it sounds great. These are, these are students that, by the time they graduate high school, are going to have, also have their associate's degree. Uh, I think it's great for the school. I think it's great for those students. Uh, but I was just concerned because we all send kids to college, and sometimes we're talking hundreds of thousands yeah. of dollars. Yeah. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure that we're not getting into something like that because we still got books, we got the, you know, transportation, we have, the, you know, 
it's a bunch of items, so that was one of them. But okay, so I just want to discuss. Just I mean, one. you can leave okay. that on there. Leave it on. I can discuss one quick it. question on that, um, Mr. Castles. With with this uh, resolution, how many students can we accommodate for this? Maximum No, not the test. Uh, how many? Uh, if one, once they get through the accurate place, I got that. Uh, how many students can we accommodate in the high school for the early college experience? Renee Bush said 30. Yeah, it's 30. So, yeah. yeah, 30 per year. It's 30 per year. And then the only problem would be... Uh, is it on this? I don't, I don't see that. That's no, just to take the, the AccuPlacer. Yeah, this is just to test. take the test. That's just to take the AccuPlacer. What we're voting on tonight is actually just to take the test. So we're just taking the test. The but I'm looking like qualify. maybe a step or two forward. Um, how many students can we accommodate for this program at the high school level? Max 30. 30 per year. 30? Yes. 30 per What's the year. max per classroom? 30 in a classroom? Yes. Okay. Folks, before we leave personnel, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Kopaz. Please go to C6. I, I had to do more. Oh, I'm sorry, That's Joe. Okay. <laughs> hey, I'm a new guy in this finance. That's all right. <laughs> And then, uh, what was my name? I just did C-15. I did mm -hmm. yes. uh, C-16. Uh, once again, I'm not against any of these things. Trust me, I don't want to get a bad rap here. But uh, <coughs> looking at this and knowing how many people have moved classrooms and this and that, and I was under the impression that any time you want to improve a teacher situation or teaching situations or decrease their situation, uh, that really has to go to negotiations. And I just don't know if it's something we should be doing here. Uh, it's in the contract. It's not in Maybe the contract. we should hold this conversation for inside, Joe. Yeah, I'd like to see it in the contract, please. <coughs> um, it, 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 that, that's the folks, rich by let's, now. let's do 16 inside, folks. It's not let's there. Do, let's do 16 inside before we say something that's going to get us in trouble. Especially with the union sitting right behind us. <laughs> and the other one, Joe? <laughs> the last one I had was, um, where are we? C31. If I can get the C31, I've got to find it. You don't mind? The job description. Job, yes. Um, just bring up the fact that, um, as far as I didn't want to vote, I could, is that a lot of us went through a lot of hard times. Uh, couple of years ago, and one of the promises I made at that time was not to create new positions. And this seems to fall, for me, it falls under the idea of a new position, and uh, I just thought we'd need more discussion about it, or, you know, exactly what this would be. The last time, in fact, using this title, the last time I remember this title, I think it was uh, Dr. McGuire. <laughs> Was way back yeah. when. So I'm just uh, before we get into something like that, I would I would think we I would need to hear more about it. Once again, not that it's a bad idea. Reading uh, what what it, this person would do, it sounds like a tremendous thing. Uh, but I did make a promise that uh, I wouldn't be voting for new positions unless it affected children or the students or whatever. So uh, that's when I saw that, I just thought it I'd certainly does affect children. <coughs> I'm sorry, I didn't it, have it. It certainly, it certainly does affect children, insofar as it's for social media, so everybody can communicate with the district. Um, it's someone that reports to me. The job description, I'm sure you've read, is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You're on call. You post to social media, um, uh, our website, all our social media platforms. Uh, it's to be progressive in case we're, we, there's, there's a posting that needs to go out. Uh, I've had occasion since being the superintendent and knowing the size of and scope of our district that we don't have that. There should be a media person that consults. This media person should, con should report directly to the superintendent and no one else so that there's an ebb and flow of information that comes from the superintendent because ultimately I'm responsible for everything that happens in the district. Rightly or wrongly so, I am. Therefore, I 1,000% think we need to have this. This is not a, a, uh, a position that we're hiring right now. It's creating a job description, which that's all it is. The same, and I'm sure um, 
I don't know if you, you, you on that same resolution that you're uh, speaking about, but on uh, a culinary baking person, I think that's a fantastic thing uh, that we do for our, for our school. And you know what? Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be recommending a lot of positions that we should have in this district, and uh, I, I believe that's the right thing to do. Um, I, I certainly respect your opinion, and I respect your vote, but I, I'm, I'm recommending that that's this be, you know, voted on. I think it's the right thing to do. I once again, I didn't, I'm not saying no, no, no. I'm just, I'm just being clear. They're all great ideas. It's just that I'm under that impression that uh, after what happened. Yeah. I'm taking my doll and putting it under the mattress. I'm not uh, yeah. spending it on the, you know, the new thing. <laughs> so, uh, if you can, um, if I can just review, perhaps I'm I'm wrong on this. Uh, I, I don't think Jean. It was during your tenure as um, president of of the union, but in order to get that 2.5 percent increase in. Uh, especially in our teacher salary, there are a number of concessions that had to be given up. Uh, a number includes, and it sounds like nothing, but we, we couldn't provide two smart boards for the classroom, totally crucial to, uh, instruction. Two, we gave up the initiative of panic buttons for safety got that. And three, to my understanding, and maybe Dr. Degnan can correct me, maybe I misunderstood, but we're still short for language teachers. Uh, one you're short concern... short study team people, you're short guidance counselors, you're short administrators. We're short a lot of things. Yeah, exactly. And so that I'm I don't going want to, put to that add to... I'm going to put that all back. You don't worry about a thing. Well, That's I, why I'm here. Well, I want to see it all put back, well, it will and be. then maybe we consider this, but... Yeah. Are we short four language teachers? I, I see somebody nodding to my yeah. left. Yes. Yeah, yes. We have to cover, you have to have direct instruction K to, K to 8. We okay. have two right now. Yeah. So I, I understand where we're going here with the communication specialists, but I think what we need really to do is to prioritize. We what haven't are hired anybody. We're just creating a this is can I ask question? Creating a, a, yeah. a job That's description. We're not hiring. So you, you're not going to post this job without without coming to the board first? No, I could post it tomorrow oh, if okay. I wanted to, but I'm not. Okay. I, I listen. I just I just said to everybody, we're going to fix what's broken. That's what I'm here for. If I don't fix it, I got to go somewhere else. I'm here to fix this. Well, I would love to see a job posting for four language teachers then. Enough said. <clears throat> All right, I, Joe, that's good. Yes, thank you, sir. Gary, I have one I'd like to bring to the attention of trustees and Mr. Neese. In regards to C10, it's a trip to Greece, and <clears throat> it's dated March 31st to April 13th. Now, I'm a firm believer in travel and world culture. Uh, just the fact that it's a precarious world, and there's plenty of time for us to make a decision on this. But for next year. It is, yeah, yeah. For like 20, it's 21. 2021. 21. 21. Yeah. Okay. They're just putting the paperwork now to find out if there's any interest from the students. On okay. Yeah. But I don't want to do that without the board knowing about it. Okay. Oh, world, um, world politics. Hello. Like I, that. We saw it already. So it can change overnight. I'm going to put them on non consent unless something happens exactly. inside that. Something happens in Turkey. There's no way we're allowing right. our students to right. go. Currently, like, if you go on a department. No, well, right now, it's website, just it's projecting. Well, we you see, that's what I was thinking as well. I, I know. I, we're this time we have plenty of right. time to approve of it. Or if, to if, we, if we get to the, if the yeah. children are approved and something happens, something happens, and the State changing. Department puts that, we stop right. the trip from happening. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The right. They, right. They, 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 yeah, they, the State Department gives me. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, exactly. you can't go. You can't go. <laughs> no travel. So this is just to allow parents for the no. trip to, I for them go to start as collecting a chaperone, parents, please. for them to know. To so raise funds. So at this funds. time, yeah. I'd like to turn the meeting over to Mr. Kopaz. Please turn to C6 and C7. 
Thanks, Doc. In accordance with the Bayonne Board of Education Policy 5512, during this reporting period, five incidents of harassment, intimidation, and bullying have been reported and investigated at the following schools. One incident at Harvest Man has been investigated and confirmed. Strategies and resources have been provided to the victim to assist in the recovery process. Consequences and remedial measures were given to the offender. All documentation is being retained by the anti-bullying coordinator. One incident at Philip G. Room, two incidents at Nicholas Oresco, and one incident at Washington Community School. In these four cases, there was no confirmed evidence of the investigated acts of HIV. Strategies, resources, and remedial measures were implemented. All documentation is being retained by the school anti-bullying coordinators. That's C6. C7 is a mandate from the state. Um, incidents that fall under the categories of violence, vandalism, substance, weapons, um, and HIV need to be reported to the state. There are two reporting periods. This is the first from September 1st to December 31st, and then we will again report to the board at a public hearing from January 1st to June 30th. We had 29 incidents at our 12 schools from September 1st to December 31st. Here's the breakdown for you. If you have any questions, we have all the documentation in my office. And thank you, Dr. Mayer. I have one quick question, Dr. Mayer. I realize it has nothing to do with harassment and bullying, but the, form, form, the forming of the calendar for next year. Um, we have, we're going to have school on the same day as a presidential election. Is that something we've done in the past? Election day, we have a full day of school, presidential election. I, w I was just wondering about the rationale on that. We have in the past. Uh, we will have uh, school this June uh, for election. Uh, for years, we had it. This year, veterans falls out, uh, on Wednesday. And uh, we thought that it was uh, so important to have off from school um, to uh, four hour veterans. So this uh, Tuesday, the election day precedes Veterans Day. Okay. That's All right. I didn't really look at look well, we, at it we that issues way. Issues in the past about our attendance. So uh, yes. you know, we were off okay. on Monday and in on Tuesday, or uh, and then back in on Wednesday, and our attendance was uh, terrible. So we went to the week off. Uh, the issue is we wanted to make sure that we were off for Veterans Day and still give that time to improve attendance. Uh, again, during that week in November, it was very poor attendance. So we're trying to improve attendance, and one is to be strategic with our calendar. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, folks, at this time we're going to adjourn for an executive session for legal, personnel, and negotiation items. It is 6.55. That was a great one.